Hello and welcome to this Pale Face Edition of the DVD Reviews! Today we got the review of the DVD of the independent film directed by Master of Horror fucking George A. Romero called Bruiser! Bruiser is a little independent film from the early 2000s. Marks George Romero's big comeback after not directing a movie for almost 10 years. Had a dark half, he fucked off, he went and he wrote a bunch of scripts that couldn't get turned into movies. He had enough bullshit sitting around fucking with his thumb up his ass, so he decided to come back, make a fucking independent movie, found a script he liked, and he did it. Came back with Bruiser. Bruiser, in a lot of ways, marks the departure and a fucking, you know, a whatever sign of things to come for George Romero. First movie not shot in fucking Pittsburgh, although he did get some Pittsburgh fuckers in it. It was one of his first big migrations to fucking Toronto, Canada and shit, where he's kind of set up shop. He actually even lives up there now and shit. So, you know, Bruiser, it's not your fucking, you know, your traditional George Romero, but I think he's still on point. He's still got some cool tricks up his sleeve. Movie tells the story of a guy named Henry Crelo, just like a nerdy whatever fucking business suit and tie motherfucker gets up every morning, fucking shaves and shit in the shower. Wakes up one morning, hears a fucker on the radio, on like a talk show and shit, calling in, fucking all fed up with life and shit. And he starts really like uh, identifying with this guy, being like, yeah, man, fuck the world. The world's full of a bunch of assholes. But the guy on the fucking radio, man, he fucking kills himself, blows his brains out right on the air. Fucking Henry's like, holy shit, man. He fucking goes, he goes to work, man. Like, he's talking about this fucking thing. Nobody gives a shit, man. Nobody gives a shit that some fucking guy blew his brains out on the radio. Now during this incident, and you know, Henry relating to this guy fucking blew his top, you're starting to get inside Henry's mind a little bit. He starts having these like little hallucinatory bullshit fantasies about fucking killing people. Just like rude motherfuckers pushing him out of the way at the subway station and shit. You know, you could tell that this is a man that just had enough tired of fuckers walking lower with him. His fucking wife is a bitch trying to fucking cuck hold him and shit. He got a fucking buddy named Jim who's just fucking, you know, he's like a little weasel, slick Wall Street fucker. He, Henry's been giving all his investments and retirement shit to this guy. Fuck, but somehow, all you know, the money keeps coming up short and shit. You know, he never is able to make out on these deals somehow. Worst motherfucker of all, at his job, Henry works at a fucking, like, a high fashion magazine called Bruiser. That's where the fucking name of the title of the fucking movie comes into play. Is his fucking boss. Fucking played by Peter Stormare. I'll tell you what, man. I'm a big fucking Peter Stormare fan. I love how kooky and wacky he gets, and he really goes out there and, and like, in fact, I, I go as far to say that Peter Stormare makes this fucking movie. If you don't have Peter Stormare playing this outrageous villain fucking character and shit, this movie wouldn't go anywhere. So we're getting into the story a little bit more, starting to find out. Basically, there's a big party at Peter Stormare's house. Henry fucking brings his wife. Who? I mean, she is hot, but she's kind of like... I don't know, just like cold, fucking bitchy, whatever. Well, then we come out with the real fucking shit at the party. Peter Stormare, he's fucking pulling his dick out and shit. Henry's wife is jacking him off behind a bar, like in front of everybody. Fucking Henry, man, he don't know what to do. He just kind of turns a blind eye and shit. Later that night, his fucking cuck old ass wife <laughs> confronts him saying, I was jerking him off and you didn't do shit. She leaves him, whatever, so, you know, whatever, man. It's just like, Henry's world is coming to an end. He lives in a fucking house that... Like, it looks normal house from the outside, but inside there ain't, like, no walls, no shit. Fucking is under construction all the time because he ain't got the fucking money to finish it. He just left in this nasty, empty house. No wife, no nothing, man. Fucking shit job. He, you know, he, he probably wants to quit his job, but he can't, you know, because of fucking... I mean, who wants their fucking boss getting jerked off by their wife and shit? I mean, come on, man. He wakes up one day, and Henry ain't got no fucking face. It's just like he has like a permanently just a white blank face attached to his fucking face. Like he gets up, starts going to shave and shit. He's like, what? It feels different. He looks in the mirror. Fucking yeah, man. No fucking face at all. Fucking, you know, a lot of thematically wise, this movie's kind of like a mix of American Psycho and Lost Highway. Just like a lot of crazy fucking, you know, psychological conditions. Like weird, bizarre, <laughs> uh, you know, hallucinatory shit. You don't know what's real and what's not. Just to add to another long list of fucking shitting on Henry, his uh his Hispanic maid comes in trying to talk all this shit and this you know Espanol, you know, treating him like he's a dumbass gringo. Meanwhile, he catches her putting fucking all the fucking, you know, the silverware and shit in a bag and stuff. But she doesn't realize fucking Henry speaks Spanish. He knows what's going on. She ain't fucking tricking nobody. So he takes the shit that she stole in this bag and fucking whops her over the head. 
and she fucking hits the ground, fucking blood coming out all over, and then the fucking thing is on, man. Not gonna spoil too much, but you get the idea where this fucking thing is headed. A guy with no fucking face, he has the power to do what the fuck he wants, man, and he goes on a rampage getting even with every motherfucker who, you know, does him wrong and shit. Fucking, and of course, at the top of the list, Peter Stormare, the whole movie, he's working up his way, killing fuckers, knocking fuckers off until he gets to Peter Stormare. And meanwhile, throw a wrinkle into it, you got a cop chasing him. Here comes Pittsburgh Connection, not only than fucking drunk ass old Tom Atkins. Yeah, you fuckers, y'all love Tom Atkins. You love going to horror conventions and fucking smelling his gin and cigarette breath and getting his art and fucking autograph for 25 bucks and shit. Well, you'll get your Tom Atkins fix in here because George don't fuck, you know, you can take the boy out of Pittsburgh, but you can't take a Pittsburgh out of the boy or whatever the fuck. So he got to bring Tom Atkins in here with his fucking sleepwalking brand of <laughs> pockmark face <laughs> Acting bravado and shit. You gotta see this, man. You got fucking George Romero coming back. You got fucking Tom Maggins drunk ass. You got Peter Sumer. Peter Sumer, I don't know. His accent is always fucked up, but it's even more fucked up in this one. <laughs> you just gotta see it for the scene where he's running around the street in his fucking underwear and Tom Maggins showing up to give him some bad news about a murder that just happened. You gotta see the fucking scene. Just look for the scene where fucking Storm is running around going, What? What? No! No! No more fucking Rosie! Come on now! Off the chain, Stormare. Now this movie, you know, taken to whatever budgetary or whatever, you have to go to Toronto, you know, fucking, you know, under five million dollar budget, whatever. There is some drawbacks, you know, not a whole lot of big set pieces and shit. There is one real big fucking scene at the end about Halloween party where they actually get the fucking misfits to play. The new misfits. Well, not even the new misfits. The middle of the road misfits. Not the misfits that are around today, but the misfits were around ten years ago with Mikhail Gray singing. But the scene gets really weird because, like, there's just all these party antics going on. And, I mean, that's my own really criticism of the movie. Is George Romero, he just wanted to show all these fuckers, like, nobody's, no, like, not even, I don't know, fuckers in the, in the cast, nothing. Just nobody's running around doing Halloween pranks on each other and shit. There's a fake Misfits guitarist. So, this really bugged me every time I watch the movie. There's some guy on stage playing guitar at Misfits. Meanwhile, you know the Misfits, they're all dressed up like skulls and shit. This guy's just dressed in a wife beater. He jumps into the crowd, starts fighting people. With it. it just... I don't know, like, it just kind of, like, it's cool Misfits are in it, but then the little side gimmicky bullshit, you know, and another thing that's fucked up is, it's cool that the Misfits did three uh, original songs for this movie and shit, it came out on one of their B-side albums, like, whatever later, but, like, if you really look closely during the crowd party scenes, like the misfits on stage, you know, when they 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 mime the performance or did whatever, like they're jamming and they're fucking jumping out, but it'll be like a slow paced song on the soundtrack. So you, you like you hear the slow ballad, meanwhile you see them all jumping around, pounding their guitars and shit. So the movie started to fall apart a little bit with the end scene, you know, with the party and shit. It started getting a little bit fucking sloppy. That's my only criticism though. The rest of it was good, solid. Fantastical, borderline horror, revenge, psychological thriller shit. So as a movie, just being a wacky off the wall, George Romero going into some new territory. You know, not he, like he's not relying on his own no zombie bullshit. He took an original story and made a movie out of it and shit. I really do like Bruiser a lot. It's kind of like an underrated gym. A lot of people shit on it. Like, oh, this ain't Night Living Dead. Well, what the fuck is Night Living Dead? Come on, get your fucking twig out your ass. For the type of movie he was trying to be. And George Romero coming off a long 10 year hiatus from directing. I think it turned out good. I would give Bruiser as a movie. Because I actually have watched it a bunch of times over and over over the years. I would give it fucking 7 out of 10. On the picture and sound here, this being a DVD. And by the way, you probably think, why, why is he going back to reviewing DVDs and shit? Come on, man. It's 2013. Let's get on the Blu-ray. Fuck the DVD. Let's go. Well, you know what? Blu-ray can kiss my ass. Suck it, Blu-ray. Because you know why? Because nothing but fucking Will Smith movies and new bullshit come out on Blu-ray. I would love to have this movie on Blu-ray seat in a high quality dick, but it ain't fucking happening because only bland shit comes out on Blu-ray right now, so fuck Blu-ray. Unless it's from Screen Factory. I know you fuckers in the comments, oh, Screen Factory's coming out with all shit. They are, man, but that's one company out of a fucking million. Everybody else is fucking releasing Men in Black 3 and shit. So anyway, on to the DVD. Criticism kind of the movie is the cinematography is kind of generic in this movie. I don't like that. Romero used to have like kind of like an old school filmic look to his movies. Like I don't know how to explain it. But just an older feel. This movie looks new. It looks semi-slick but kind of middle of the road boring. You know what I mean? But that might just be from the fucking being on DVD. You know DVD has that fucking washed out colors and shit. 
So I would like to see this in high def one day. Maybe the crispness, the clearness, maybe the, you know, because there's a lot of steely grays and blues and shit. Maybe he was working with a theme of colors that just don't come through on the DVD. So, you know, but we, hey, who knows, man. The sound, the sound that kind of shit the bed a little bit, stereo sound, which I mean, if it's an old movie, like from the 80s, and it come out, like, I, I'll be fine with stereo sound. Come on, man, this is a fucking production from like 2000, fucking 1999, some shit, it, it needs some fucking surround sound, especially with the party scene, it could have been great, man, but, you know, whatever, they shit the fucking bed. Picture and sound, I can only give it fucking 6 out of 10. It was, it, it was... Wasn't shitty by DVD standards, but you know this movie was screaming for a better, you know, quality of presentation. All right, with the extra features and shit. Once again, as we find with a lot of these DVD releases, whatever, not quite a special edition, but not bare bones either. You got a commentary track on there from George A. Romero and his fucking producer buddy Grunwald. You know the one that he's working with now, doing all the Canadian shit with. Pretty good fucking commentary, not like the old, you know, not as good as the old ones where he would sit around with all the old Pittsburgh fuckers and shit, but it, I mean, any chance to hear fucking, you know, George Romero talk, I, I'll take it, man, he's my favorite director. The the best special feature on here, though, they got a Misfits music video that George A. Romero directed for the song called Scream. Uh, basically, the deal that the Misfits made is like, we'll be in your movie, George, if you come and direct our video, so he did, and the fucking video is awesome, man, I mean... I don't know, like, I really think it's one of the best zombie whatever things George Romero directed. It takes place in black and white in a fucking old looking uh, hospital and shit. After a Misfits concert, all these fuckers running in a Misfits t-shirt. They're all, like, bit up and shit. It's like, oh shit, what's happening, man? Zombie outbreak. They wheel the Misfits in and they're dead and shit. They start waking up as zombies. The zombie makeup is awesome. The zombie makeup looks so fucking good in black and white. I'm sick of all this newfangled colored bullshit that, you know, Walking Dead, War War Z. It's like, sorry, but, you know, it just don't translate. If they shot some shit in black and white, it would look so much better. So the, the Misfits, they start a zombie outbreak in the fucking hospital run around. I, I, I tell you what, it's not like a four minute music video. It's really like a film. I'll fight, you know, it's one of the best things George Romero's done in the last 20 years. I fucking loved it, man. Then as usual, you know, we get the theatrical trailer, whatever, man. It's fucking great. For basically just having only have three special features on it, I still got to rate it kind of high because once again, we're going with quality over quantity in this case. So special features on Bruce Romero, we'll give it fucking seven and a half out of ten. See the fiend without a fear.